Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Keisha Pollock-Porter, the Vice Dean for Faculty and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. This podcast is a continuation of the series on racism as a public health crisis. In this episode, I speak with Dr. Roland J. Thorpe, Jr., a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and Dr. Marino A. Bruce, a professor at the University of Mississippi Medical Center about the impacts of racism on Black men's health. So I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Roland Thorpe, Jr., a professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and Dr. Marino Bruce, a professor at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thank you both for being here with me today to talk about the very important issue of Black men's health. Thank you to two Black male professors for being here with me to talk about this topic. You're quite welcome. Yeah. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So maybe we can just start with... um, Let's kind of set the table for the conversation. You know, both of you do work in Black men's health. What does that mean to you? What does that encompass? What's, what's included in that, in, that, in that topic? So, Keisha, for, for me, I think the, the notion of uh, Black men's health or the topic of Black men's health for me is for me to be able to f- find ways to extend, uh, extend life for African-American men and have, make sure they have a good quality of life. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. And what about you, Dr. Marino? Well, just to just to extend on that, focus on not only um, black men surviving, but black men thriving. Mm. What is it that call that will help them lead um, very productive lives? Mm-hmm. And so I'm hearing. So we want to extend lives. We want black men to thrive. I love that. What What do we need to do? What are, what, what are the actually? Let me back up and say, what are our most pressing issues? What What, are, what are, Where are we falling short in terms of those health issues that are stopping black men from extending the life, living high quality of life, from thriving? I think I think where we're falling short is that I think many many uh, black men don't get annual checkups, uh, and so then we don't know uh, our health conditions. I think it's important. I know I'm from the south, and I think there's this whole notion of mistrust in the medical system from being from down south, and I think that impacts. Uh, a lot of particularly black men in the South that impacts their behavior toward accessing the care. Mm-hmm. And I'll add to that, thinking about the devaluing of black men's lives, um, both from externally or other people, but also internally, not seeing uh, themselves as um, valuing an investment, including investing in their health. So it's not necessarily to put the blame on them, uh, at all, but it's more along the lines of getting the cues from their environment that their lives are somehow uh, less than others, therefore that not worthy of an investment in them. Mm-hmm. And so, Dr. Bruce, I want to just follow up on that point a bit. You know, in terms of what have what have you seen can help black men to value themselves so that they therefore prioritize themselves? What, what are you seeing is working um, to get to that place? Uh, the uh, it's a simple thing, being visible. Uh, one of the key things about um, Black men, uh, one of the key books that that inspired this work for me is The Invisible Man. And uh, seeing Black men in, in acknowledging their value, uh, their role in society, and their importance. And so helping them get a sense that they are valuable and, and that they do matter. Mm-hmm. That goes a long way. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think key to, the, to this 
to, to not being seen, to not being heard as um, I'm sure you both agree is racism. Racism is, 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 is so important uh, when we try to unpack these issues and wondering um, uh, if you have thoughts or, or what you'd like to share about how you see racism impacting and complicating our efforts to try to improve black men's health. Sure, I, I, I'll take the first uh, uh, crack at that one. I think, you know, one of the reasons that uh, as black men, one of the reasons that we're in the condition we're in is because of the structural racism. One of the things I think that has happened is that the uh, we have this lack of intergenerational transfer of wealth due to the, uh, when after the end of World War II, you had these differences in the GI Bill for black soldiers versus white soldiers. And I think that largely impacts uh, the health outcomes because I, I think we have to know that health isn't just this standalone uh, concept and phenomena. It is intertwined with everything that we that we do with the spaces that we live in, the spaces that we occupy. Um, and, and racism permeates all those spaces, you know, for, for black men, you know, we can go back, you know, 401 years ago, we can think about as recently as uh, 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 George Floyd, and we can think about how racism still permeates Although a lot of it is unlawful now, but it still permeates how it impacts our health and it generates it can generate this level of fear in uh, among black men. And as to whatever they try to do and however they try to move in society. So that's why I typically say and I've said in other spaces that oftentimes black men are hidden in plain sight because of these structures that are that, that have uh, put us in a place and constrains us how we function in society. Mm-hmm. I like that, that, that hidden in plain sight. That's very consistent and uh, with what Dr. Bruce said, too, about being invisible. Um, what, what about you, Doc, Dr. Bruce? What, what comes to you when you think about how racism impacts Black men's health? Um, I, I love what Dr. Thorpe had said. And the only um, thing I would add to it is that after being embedded in such racist structures for so long, they begin to permeate how you think and see yourselves. So one of the things that we have not talked about in this space is internalized racism, where, um, again, we talk about the devaluating, de- devaluation of seeing oneself, but also seeing other Black men and devaluing them as well. I mean, I come at this um, because my introduction in health was through violence, seeing Black-on-Black violence among young African-American men, so that that has never left me thinking about how they devalue themselves and others who look like them. And part of it is just being, for generations, being embedded in a um, structure that operates to their disadvantage. There is so much to unpack there. Um, I want want to stay on this topic for a little bit of this internalized racism and and ask you both, you know, I, I think that this is um, a, a, an aspect of racism that I agree with you, Dr. Marino, we don't, Dr. Bruce, excuse me, we don't talk about as much, right? Like we certainly structural racism is, is critical, institutional racism, uh, but this internalized racism and how that can impact your body too, right? Can impact, I mean, how, talk about how that impacts your body as an individual um, uh, and how we think about how to address that in, in improving black men's health. So I, I think it comes down to um, as, as Dr. Thorpe talks about uh, how uh, the structures operate, where the work has to go is how do these structures get under the skin? And so one of, some of the work that Dr. Thorpe and I are doing is trying to unpack that and get a sense of how it operates. Uh, one area, of course, is looking at blood pressure. We know that uh, by and large, black men uh, will have higher levels of blood pressure even when they're sleeping. So some of the work that that we've been thinking about is, okay, how does that manifest itself to cardiovascular disease and other diseases uh, that that uh, emanate from that? So it's it's part and parcel of sometimes you can't see it uh, per se, but you know it's there. And that has an impact in terms of how much stress and strain is on your body. So it starts there. Great. Thank you. Dr. Thorpe, you have um, some thoughts you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I, one of the things that I think that um, I we've decided to do, Dr. Bruce and I've decided to do is, and we see this so often, is that when we talk about black men's health or even black women's health and in general, we, we often talk about it from a deficit base. And I, I think I think we should, I have started 
uh, reframing and talking about black men from a strength based approach to try to counter this internalized racism. We're meaningful people. We make we've made meaningful contributions to society for a number of years. We built the railroad system in the United States. And so we've done some <laughs> things in the United States. Right. Uh, that we have made meaningful contributions. We are somebody we're allowed to vote. We should practice those practice those things that we're allowed to do. The thing I want to talk about what I think how to turn the internal racism is that we need to think about things how we can better cope with these stressful situations these, as we engage these uh these society this society as well as the internalized racism how do we cope how do we um in addition to coping what are the other things that we think are will be useful for us to to be able to thrive as uh, dr bruce said so one of the things i think about that I, I you know i i'm sure we don't we think about but it's not a lot done on is think about the role of religion and the role of the african-american church mm-hmm. how it is played in the lives of african-american men right so how, you know what that's the place where we come together for you know as a group and um we get empowered there and so what can we learn from the African American church and what goes on in the African American church, mm-hmm. uh, not only religion, but also spirituality or the combination of the two. Mm-hmm. I think we need to think about coping mechanisms moving forward and, and, and think about resilience. What mm-hmm. is it that we do to, to move forward? The, but the resilience that we can, that doesn't kill us, right? So we want to make a <laughs> think about it that way. Right. right? Absolutely. We don't want to, we don't want to necessarily do the, the, we we're fighting the resilience and then we die at the end and don't have an opportunity right. Right. to be able to, prosper. Dr. Right. Bruce, I know you going to say something. Yeah, I want to follow up on that because that's the work that uh, that Dr. Thorpe and I are actually working through now is that understanding that the black church um, has been a key institution in African-American life, but in particular for African-American uh, males, uh, because that's one of the few institutions where they are indeed affirmed. That's one of the key mm-hmm. institutions where they have uh, gotten leadership training um, to uh, the church has also been been a key uh, institution where people get information about even jobs. Mm-hmm. So it's been it's been a key institution for the survival um, of African Americans, both men and women. But also, it's also a key place where uh, one spirit, um, if you want to use that term, spirit has been lifted. As because when you look at the theology within the African American church, there is a theology of liberation. Mm-hmm. So within that, there there are uh, practices, there are teachings that speak to um, folks who who feel oppressed, but also see that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. That's part that's that's baked into. Um, many black churches even today. So that's a that's a starting point. And I was so glad that Dr. Thorpe raised uh, the idea of assets because uh, the work that we are doing is trying to unpack some of that to see how both religiosity, the practice of um, religion, as well as spirituality, relationship to a power higher than oneself, how that can how that can encourage health as opposed to just preventing disease. Mm-hmm. And so much of, of and, I, and I think Dr. Thorpe, you talked about this is, you know, in terms of that shift from a deficit based approach to a strength based approach to think it's a strength based approach to thinking about assets. Um, do our researchers taught how to do that? Or, you know, if, if not, what do we need to do to help so, change, make that shift? And I see you laughing. And so. Uh, <laughs> so the answer, the answer is resoundingly no. I am. I have come to you to try to learn how to do some of these things. I, as a researcher, I, I never was afforded the opportunity. And I'm learning now how to. I think one of the most important things to do is to make sure that the research that you do on the group that you're working on, is it has an impact. In order for it to have a, a, a huge impact, I think you have to be able to create an evidence base that you can translate so that you can translate into into potentially policy relevant solutions uh, because we need we need some policy relevant solutions to help with the health and well-being of black men. And, and I think uh, we're we're just barely scraping the surface with a concerted effort on trying to understand these uh, these many different factors and how they are complex and operate synergistically to impact the uh, the outcomes of, of black men. 
So one of the things that um, Dr. Thorpe has done, I think, is put um, Black men's health front and center. In, in his center at um, in the School of Public Health there um, and has um, been consistent in raising these issues um, in a number of different scientific communities, which has, um, in many respects, um, put a, uh, opened, a, opened the door a bit for those of us who have been doing work in other areas uh, to follow. So I think uh, with his work and in his um, him being prolific in putting a number of publications out there uh, provide has been a major contribution to the evidence base um, that those of us who write grants in this space can begin to uh, demonstrate to reviewers and also reviewers of grants as well as manuscripts that there's science around this. This is not only about how people feel per se or, or using anecdotal evidence, but using um, rigorous uh, scientific methodology to explore some of these relationships and associations that we often talk about, but now we're beginning to explore empirically. One of the things I love about this conversation is, you know, both of you are Black men, both of you are professors, both of you are academics. Talk about how personal this is for you. Um, I'm, 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 I, am, I am claiming that it is personal for you. That's why I'm asking my question that way. So I'd love to hear you reflect on that a bit for me um, about why you, why you do this work. So, yeah, wow. So um, it's really personal to me. Both of my, uh, both of my grandfathers died early of uh, heart disease. When I say early, I think they were in there. Um, one was 60, late 60s. And I think the early, the other one was, um, 62 and they died much like my father who died three years ago. All of them died. They, I'm from Macon, Georgia in the South. All of them died because they failed to go to the doctor and get annual checkups. My father went because he was a federal employee and he was required to go. But after he retired, he, uh, he retired, he didn't go. And it, it became very personal because I wanted to understand why, how I could at least be a voice for black men to encourage them to go to the doctor, encourage them to understand what their health profile is, encourage them to think about doing things to the extent possible within their environment and spaces that they occupy to keep themselves at least to keep themselves healthy and, and strong. Because uh, one of the things we haven't said is that we, um, Black men are key integral pieces to society, particularly the uh, African-American community. We can't walk our daughters down the aisle if we can't walk down the aisle, right? We can't play with and coach our sons if we in a hospital bed uh, because we didn't want to you know, go find out what was wrong with us. I think it's very important and it's very personal, man. So I've dedicated the rest of my career to focusing on uh, black men's health. And I, you know, I'm, I've been saying this for five years, maybe one day somebody hear me. I think we need to have at the state and federal level, some office somewhat similar to the office of research of women's health that catalogs and houses work on not only black men, but men of color. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, cause it's different. Um, there, there's different approaches. And I just think that we don't have that. And without that, we don't have any allocation of resources mm -hmm. for us, uh, at any level. Um, and I think we need that to be able to help us, uh, fight, continue to fight our cause. But I do my work and I, I dedicate it to my grandfathers and my father. Thank, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Dr. Thorpe and Dr. Bruce, what about you? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, this is where, um, I have to think about so many folks, uh, this comes from uh, not only uh, me as an individual, but also me in the, as a minister in the church, where you see a number of younger Black men being funeralized um, well before their time. And so um, it comes down to how is it that we can uh, extend life, not only just life in terms of breathing, but prosperous life. It comes down to um, giving African-American males, um, even when they're younger, a chance to have a prosperous enjoy the fruits of living. Um, uh, very much like Dr. Thorpe, when I think about the males, particularly on my father's side of the family, very few of them live to be beyond 
65 years of age. So one of the things I often tell men, particularly when I meet with them in church settings, is many of them, if not all of them work, they contribute to a retirement system that they cannot afford the benefits of because they often die before they can retire. Mm-hmm. So for me, again, like Dr. Thorpe, it's very personal because we are humans. We have contributed to this society. If you look at world history, we contributed to the world. And it's important that we are there to represent um, the best of who we are. Mm-hmm. And when we, in order to do that, we have to be healthy, not only physiologically, but also mentally and spiritually as well. Mm-hmm. It's that holistic. Well, I, I, um, I just want to thank you for sharing this wisdom from both of you. And, and, I, and I hope that, that listeners are able to walk away from this conversation rethinking this, this emphasis or how we talk about Black men in terms of more of a deficit frame and really lifting up uh, strengths, um, assets, and, and really really resisting the deficit base. And, and the other thing I think is really also talking about how, how racism can get under your skin. I think that that's really important. I hope people take that away as well in terms of the internalized racism you talked about. And both of you made these um, eloquent references to being invisible and to Black men being invisible and how, what, what can we do? And I'll challenge all the listeners to think about what can they, what can we all do to support um, making Black men visible, right? So they can thrive and be healthy and sustain um, a long life. So um, so I thank you both for your, your time today. I'm, I'm grateful. Um, and again, thank you, Dr. Thorpe from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And thank you, Dr. Bruce from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Please continue to keep up the excellent work you're doing to advance the health for black men in this country. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so very much. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.